In Yeshua, we proclaim that you are our Passover lamb. And we proclaim today the power of your blood. We proclaim there is life in your blood. It sets us free from sin and death. And through your blood, we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins, and cleanse consciousness, consciousness. You make us holy. And by your blood, the word of our testimony and lo loving not our lives unto death, we overcome the enemy of our souls, the accuser of the brethren. Our hearts are full of love for you, Yeshua, mm -hmm. knowing that while we were yet sinners, you died for us. And before we take of the cup, I know you're holding it. It looks, yeah, it's, it, it's, a, good, <laughs> it's a good visual. <laughs> but before we take the cup, I feel really prompted to bring something forward. It's a declaration that Lou Engel released on the Global Communion Gathering that was April 18th in Jerusalem. This gathering was hosted by Watchmen for the Nations. And its primary purpose, I just love this, primary purpose was to come together, the nations to come together with Jewish and Arab family in the Lord from Israel to share in the joy of communion together. Just before communion, Lou made an incredible declaration from Isaiah 25. And this, I'm gonna read you the scripture, it's not, and then I'll, I'll let you know what the declaration is. So the scripture from Isaiah 25, uh, the part that he used was on this mountain, Jerusalem, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast, a banquet of aged wine. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. From that, he made a very simple procl proclamation I will read the proclamation as he said it. And I, I'm asking if there is agreement for us to proclaim it in this time. So it would come alongside the proclamation from April 18th and it would bring it forward again. So the proclam so Lou's proclamation was, he goes, I feel to, sorry. Yeah, he declared that as we take communion, we declare the veil that covers all nations is being ripped away by the blood. So I'm just wanting to ask if there is agreement for us as the Glo Global Watch to proclaim today in agreement, and Kathy's posted it on the chat, today in agreement with the Global Communion Declaration, we agree with the global communion declaration and one another. As we take communion, we declare the veil that covers all nations is being ripped away by the blood, the blood of Yeshua. So if you could not, if you, it, it looks like there is strong agreement. Okay. Mm -hmm. I would love it if everyone unmuted. It doesn't matter what it sounds like to our ears. The sound of it rising up to heaven is going to be spectacular. Right, Sarah? <laughs> <laughs> okay, everyone on mute. And hey, Bruce, you've, you've got, I think you've got a stronger voice than me. Can you just start us off? And we're gonna, we're gonna hey, follow. Yeah. The day hey. in agreement hey. with the global hey. communion. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. That was perfect. Now I, I want to call Kwa King. She'll, she'll orientate us 
to the next part. We want to welcome Bruce. He's my friend and today I was actually reminded by somebody that I've known him for longer than I thought. We even went on a road trip in 1999. <laughs> I didn't know that, I, can't, I couldn't remember that far. But Bruce is a, a pastor. He's also a, a prophet and an apostle. And he, his passion is for prayer. He prays and he prays and he fasts. And he also is a releaser of all people who pray. And right now, for, for the last, last few years, he's been traveling a lot and his passion has been on. And he's carrying this passion and this mission of redeeming education from the secularism. And the, uh, the company he's with, uh, company by which I mean is that the movement is called the Third Education Revolution. And um, he can talk to you more about that if you're interested, but it is uh, quite amazing. They are even uh, setting agenda. They are write writing curriculums for anyone that wants to uh, embrace that movement. So here you go, Bruce. We'd love to hear from you. Kwa King, I remember 1999 in the drive with you, and it is a fond, dear memory. And my heart is saddened that you don't remember, but I am completely fine. And I'm only having fun. I have a lot of fun with Kwa King. But I want to say I am so honored to be able to be here with you all. I so enjoy being around intercessors. I love being in prayer. And I love the dynamic of what we can do in the realm of the spirit. And although our voices may not have harmonized, there may not have been a unity or a harmony in voice, but in heart and in spirit there was. And therefore, there was a significant amount accomplished in the realm of the spirit. I don't know who is uh, hosting this, but I'm wondering if you could do screen share so I could share some PowerPoints. And as you're doing that, uh, let me know when it's done. Actually, Bruce, you can go ahead and do it yourself because I've made you co-host. All right. Okay. Can you see that? Yes. All right. I want to identify just in the decree that we made, I would center what I'm about to share with you around declaring his decree. And this is what we see in the context of Esther, but also in, a, in uh, Lamentations 3.37, it says, who can speak and have it happen unless the Lord has decreed it? So we can't just declare a decree unless he has already done so. And yet he does everything through his ecclesia because Psalms 2, 7 says, I will declare his decree. So there's a partnership and a participation that we have. I believe what the Lord is doing in this time is he's giving incredible revelation of why maybe prayer or intercession, intercession fails at times. The disciples, they said, Lord, teach us how to pray. Now realize these are good Jewish boys. They understood how to pray. They were taught to pray. But they saw his effectiveness and the results in Jesus's prayer. And very similar to what it says in reference to Elijah in James 5, it says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man has great power. So what I'm wanting to touch on are the patterns and the protocols revealed in Esther Esther prophetically foreshadows an awakened ecclesia. She is governing, legislating, advocating, and decreeing God's will on earth just as it is in heaven. Now, before we're going to look at the pattern and the protocols in Esther, we're going to briefly look at ecclesia. And I'll say ecclesia, that word began in Athens, Greece, where it was used as the city-state church government. Now, the Romans and their empire adopted it, and Jesus co-opted the terminology. He didn't say, I'm going to build my temple. He didn't say, I'm going to build my synagogue, but I'm going to build my ecclesia, which is a legislative governing assembly, and that's what it's in reference to. And so that's what we are doing when we're coming together. And so, But what I want to be able to look at 
Even though God sometimes reveal his, reveals his will, we fail. In 1 Corinthians 10, 6 and 11, it first of all talks about Israel and what God did of opening the Red Sea, manna from heaven, water from a rock, and yet it talks about their failures as well and why the majority died in the wilderness other than Joshua and Caleb and the next generation. And it's the lack of faith and the fear and the disobedience. Or in when they went into the promised land, even though God in Deuteronomy 2.24 said to Israel, I've given you possession, begin to possess, engage your enemy in battle. He reveals his will, and yet they had the victory at Jericho, but when they went to Ai, 36 innocent people died and Israel lost the battle. Now, why did that happen? It's because of Achan's sin at Jericho, and then the people did not seek the Lord. This is a small place, and they were presumptuous for one, and they also, had they sought the Lord, he would have revealed Achan's sin before they would have went forward. And we also see the Gibeonite deception, so we see presumption and we see sin as two of the primary failures in the history of Israel. And if we look at Matthew 18, first of all, Jesus only talks about the church twice. Matthew 16 is the universal church. Matthew 18, it's the local church about a governing assembly and how we are legislating. And it's talking about if your brother sins, go to him. If he doesn't listen, take two or three more and let every word be confirmed by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he doesn't pay attention to them, Tell it to the church, and if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. You're still loving him, but be, he becomes an outsider. And it goes on to talk about the dynamic of binding what's been bound in heaven, loosing what's been loosed in heaven, and doing that here on earth. And he goes on in verse 19, again I say to you that if two believers on earth agree so now there's got to be the agreement. I really appreciated Karen going, are we in agreement? Before we make this decree, is there a unity and an agreement with it's the time, the decree is on, and we are going to be in agreement? Because two or three constitutes a legislative assembly. There's a quorum when there's two or three believers together in his name, and they're agreeing upon what they're praying, on what they're decreeing. There's a harmony that's there of one heart and one mind. Then when they ask, according to his will, he hears. But of also in verse 20, it says, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them or in their midst or in the middle. But if you look at the overall context, it's inferring I am there governing. I am there presiding. I am there leading. I am there ratifying the decisions that you are making. But there's got to be two or three in agreement to ratify these decisions. We have to recognize the inc incredible power of agreement. And my desire is to get us to the place of a recognizing there are protocols, there are processes that if we bypass in our independence, we're not going to see the same results in prayer as we potentially could if we really are doing it his way. So when we look at this, when we... Okay. When we, when we look at this, if we look at 1 Corinthians 5, 1 to 8, the man sleeping with his father's wife, the church as a whole had to put him outside of the church it's a disciplinary action with a redemptive heart, but we also have to see the objective is, if we are not self-governing and dealing with the sin, especially sexual sin and disunity that, where there's divisions, what happens is we lose our authority in prayer because the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man or a righteous ecclesia has great power. So as Achan, because he sinned, 36 innocent people die at Ai. If we are not dealing with the dynamics of what's going on in the context of the body, we're not necessarily having the same authority to be able to obtain the promises when we pray. We see it in the context of the Old Testament, and there's many illustrations in the New Testament 
Another illustration of this legislative assembly would have been in Acts 15 over the circumcision debate. And so there were some certain Jewish believers that felt like all the Gentiles needed to be circumcised. Peter shares his testimony of Cornelius's house, how the Spirit came, and the Holy Spirit real, really now is the seal instead of circumcision, and that he poured it out without them being circumcised. Paul shares miracles, signs, and wonders without the Gentiles being circumcised, and how the Spirit is accepting them, embracing them, and moving among them. James shares a scripture out of, out of Amos 9 and 11 and 12 about rebuilding the tabernacle of David so that the Gentiles may seek the Lord. Now, what I'll also want to be able to identify, there's a story in Judges 19, 20, 21, where Israel and the 11 tribes are going to be bringing God's discipline and his judgment to the Benjamite tribe for the, vi the sexual violations that were done there. But they lo lose the first two battles, but you can see there's an independence there. There's not a seeking of the Lord. And we have to be able to ask the questions, why does the ecclesia fail to enforce God's will on earth? Maybe his executive don't understand what his will is. Maybe his executives don't know their authority. Maybe his executives don't understand his protocols or ways. So it's knowing God's will, but of also really understanding his ways as well. We see patterns in the context of, of creation. I really enjoy this one, Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2, when it talks about God creating the heavens and the earth. It says the earth is formless and void, and darkness covered the earth. In the Hebrew, it means it was in chaos. It was in confusion. It was dis, in disorder, and therefore, it was worthless. And the first thing God said is, let there be light. And then what we see is every day is done in a sequ sequential order of creation. And I could spend probably days teaching just on this alone, but he's creating a flourishing environment for, for man to be able to succeed in. Now, here's another interesting one. In Exodus 25, when Moses is told to build the tabernacle exactly according to the pattern revealed from heaven, it's about a model. But then it's repeated in Exodus 26 and 30, and now it's a different word. That word pattern is the word justice or mishpat, and it really means to set an order or arrangement. So we had the brazen altar, the laver, the, uh, the table of showbread, the lampstand, and the altar of incense. And then we have the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Presence was. And it's a process whereby we go in to encounter God, but they had to set it up. And if they did, the presence of God filled the pattern and filled that place. But I don't think it's just unique to that. Wherever we wind up being God's house and we build it according to his justice, arranging things in the order, his presence is there. And then when we're praying his will, he is ratifying our prayers and we're seeing the results of that. So here's the pattern that I see and the protocols that I see that's there in, in the context of Esther. First of all, what happens in, is an alarm or an alert. As a result of, of the decree of Haman, Mordecai is the first one to become aware of it. And he goes into a fast and sackcloth and ashes which if you study this dynamic, it's always about humility and about repentance as well as seeking the Lord. So first of all, what's going on in the, wor in the world is to be an awakening, an alarm to make us aware and to alert us to what's going on. The next portion is about fasting and prayer, supplication and petition, third intercession, Fourth, wait for the extended scepter of the king, his authority and favor. Wait for the king's signet ring. Celebrate the decree as victory is uh, as victory guaranteed in advance, and then strategize for on the ground battle. So, just going through these quickly. So, where the alarms are identifying strategic enemy targets. 
those dynamics of what's going on in the context of our world, we can see the targets that God is wanting us to hit. But as we identify that there are many targets, I think that we need the agreement in the ecclesia, which one the spirit is leading and guiding us to at the time. And we need to be like the sons of Issachar. When it said they understood the times and they knew what Israel should do, everything in chapter 12 of 1 Chronicles 12 is about warfare. Every tribe had different capacities in warfare. But the sons of Issachar, their capacity was strategizing. Very interesting what they had. And just like it talks about in Matthew 16, 3, Luke 12, 56, they understood the times. And so these are the sons of Issachar, and they know what we should do. So I'm going to briefly just touch on a few of these. But in the, in the whole thing of prayer and fasting, once again, I believe God is going to be increasing the call to us fasting. And other than just the explicit scriptures, when you study the context where they fasted and where they were successful in a greater way, there's always seems to be fasting included with it. But if you look at Esther, first of all, Mordecai fast in Esther 4.3, then Esther fast, and she calls uh, the Jews to fast as well through Mordecai. And then on the third day of the fast, she goes before the king. So she's preparing herself through humility, through repentance, uh, through seeking the Lord, through fasting, to get ready to go before the king. And later on in, in Esther 9.31, this is part of the Feast of, of Purim, is the fasting becomes a part of it. If we look at back to the reference that I made to in Judges, it's 19, 20, and 21. But the verse 26, the first two times, even though the Lord said, yes, go engage the Benjamites, your brothers, in battle, they lost the battle. But even though God said it, they didn't do God's will God's way this third time. What they did is they fasted that day until evening, and they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. Remember David, when he brought in the ark the first time he failed, and Uzzah even died because he brought it on a cart? And then it, it was completely God's heart and will for David to bring it in, but he didn't do it God's way. So here, Israel, they're doing God's will. God, even each time they asked, said, go ahead, but... They were not understanding God's way, nor did they study the history and scripture of the ways of God. But here, they, what they do is they simply fast. They offer an offering to the Lord, and this time, they wind up having victory. And this time, the Lord, even though he says, go, but this time he says, I will hand them over to you. So we see the victory this time as well. So... In that, the third portion is intercessory preparation and protocols. So what's happening is the dynamic of Esther, she's, she's willing to even die to be able to go before the king when she's not been summoned, which is unlawful for her to do. And the only hope she has is he's in a favorable mood to extend his scepter. And so really intercession is is. It's more than regular prayer. It's praying God's will by God's spirit. It's empathizing. It's identifying with the need of the other that you're willing to be able to pay the price uh, at your own expense to meet the need of another. And that's what the intercessor is willing to do. It's what it talks about of Jesus in Isaiah 53. But my friend today just reminded me of something and Kwa King was there, but we've got to realize Intercession co must come from a place of royalty, that we're ro a royal priesthood, we're royalty and that we're kings. Esther is in a royal position. It's so beneficial when we're not praying from earth towards heaven, but from being seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that we are praying from that place of seated in him in a heavenly place and from heaven towards earth. I'll tell you, my friend shared a story today, and I've heard so many more of the results when people have gotten this revelation and they start praying from being seated in heavenly places, which is the finished work of Christ, based upon what he has already done, what's already been atoned for, what's already been redeemed, 
And it's from that position of authority and royalty that we're praying from. And so as I've got here, the Ephesians 2, 6, he's raised us to be seated with him. But then number four is you're waiting for the scepter of favor and authority. This is why when you're praying with a group of people, you go, okay, has the scepter of favor and authority been extended to us? Have we brought our, as we brought our petitions and our supplication and our request before the Lord? Have we gained the ground that we're actually in the king's court and we've gained the ground? We're in that secret place and now we're deliberating together with them. This is what it talks about in Esther 5 2 that's taken place. So we need to discern whether we've done that. So often what I see sometimes, well, not often, depending on the maturity, I see intercessors moving independently of one another instead of discerning. Have we taken that step one of the fasting? Have we gained the favor where the scepter has been extended to us? And as we're doing that, and then the fi another stage would be discern, have we been given the king's signet ring which represents his authority to write and to speak a decree. And we see in Esther 8.2 and 8.8 that the signet ring has been given. Now, it's interesting. Joseph was given the Pharaoh's signet ring. Zerubbabel in, ha in the book of Haggai is made the Lord's signet ring. And the prodigal son, when, the, when he returns, the father not only robes him, but he puts his ring on his finger. That's a signet ring. It's the authority over the inheritance. Even though you've squandered everything, I'm giving you the authority over the inheritance. And so he, he has that even regardless of what he's done. But we have to go, have we, like Joseph, like the prodigal, or in the place of intercession, like Mordecai and Esther, received the signet ring that now we can declare a decree? If you see a situation going on in the world, whether it's the Russia-Ukraine war, and you have a scripture and you just speak it out. We've got to realize until the Lord declares a decree. And we have come to the point of we believe we've gained the ground in the spirit. And we're in agreement. And we might even identify, you know what? We're making a decree related to the Chinese and what's going on in China. Well, we might ask Kwa King to do that because of her Chinese background. And we say, we believe you're the one that's to make this decree. So we're even going through the process of who is to declare the decree. You may even agree on the wording of it as well, because I'll tell you, when we start understanding these processes that are there in the context of scripture, we're going to start seeing more results than we've ever seen before. So my heart is that we start, that God is going to increase our revelation and understanding because he wants us to be more effective, and we want to be more effective. Now, the interesting thing as well is when the decree came, what we see in, in the rest of Esther 8 is multitudes of those in the Persian Empire, they become Jews. But of also, Mordecai is robed in royal apparel and a blue and white with a large crown of gold and with robe of linen uh, and purple wool. But the Jews rejoiced and they shouted. And what we see is even before the battle, they're all celebrating the victory in advance because it's like God has spoken, the decree is there. And just as Second Chronicles 20 and Jehoshaphat, they celebrate in advance, just as Paul and Silas in prison, they start to sing praises to God at midnight and they're celebrating in advance. Now, even though that this is going on and it's not detailed, if you look at the number seven here, is you strategize for on-the-ground battle. Because the Jews, they assembled in their cities, so they gathered together uh, in the provinces, and so did it with the help of the governors, the chief rulers, and the princes, that all, who all came to work and fight with the Jews, because the fear of the Lord had fallen on them all. And they defeated 75,800 of their enemies of those who hated them. So I still believe that what God wants to do is after we break through in the spirit, that we really get a strategy how to be able to now win the battle on the ground.
Now, this is a short time, and so I'm, go I'm gonna end there. I can send my notes uh, to Karen and to Kathy and to others, and they can send them out if you're wanting my notes or want the PowerPoints. Uh, even though I'm going over this quickly, I'm really trusting in the spirit that you're grasping what I'm talking about, and the Lord's gonna continue to reveal more just in regards to this. Uh, but he's really training our fingers for battle and our hands for war, that we start experiencing more victory together, and we are going to be a functional ecclesia in the area of intercession and decrees like never before. We're going to start having story after story of greater levels of advancement, of taking the ground, experiencing the promises because of the way that we're going to be governing ourselves, that we're going to be a functional ecclesia that has a powerful effect and influence in prayer. And the Lord is teaching us in this hour, and we're going to start experiencing more. And I'm looking forward to the testimonies that are going to come as he increasingly gives us revelation. But thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure to be able to be with you and share. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Bruce. Wow. I think we all feel like we've been under a waterfall. We're so glad you <laughs> pro-offered your notes because you knew we would hound you until we got them. <laughs> so, so yeah, don't worry that you didn't catch every word. It's impossible when to do that when Bruce speaks. And we will make um, we will get the notes and make them available. Okay. So um, we just want, let me see, what is the time? We're doing, wow, we are doing excellent, praise God. This is quite miraculous for our group. Um, we have two things in mind. One is a brief time of group prayer. I mean, to get that immediate focus, we're pulling, we're gonna pull forward Psalm 46. And um, Kathy will, Joaquin's gonna share something first, but. Um, when we're kind of launched in, into prayer mode, um, Kathy will post just three really simple prayer points taken from um, Psalm 46. Feel free to get it and, and pray into the word as the Lord leads you. Um, Joaquin, can you, can you orient, help orientate us into this time? Yes, I, I feel like that I need to be really brief because I really, really want us to pray. Um, it's just uh, the lately we have been um, settled or, or focusing on one of the names of the Lord, which is uh, the Lord Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. And there are many scriptures, many, many mention of it is actually one of the names that is most mentioned, most mentioned in the Bible is the Lord of hosts. And the first mention uh, the Lord of hosts is actually the, the, the army, the Lord of the army. So it, the, the connotation seems like to be like war, warrior, stands. But uh, interestingly, the first mention is uh, in the Bible is in 1 Samuel when Hannah, Hannah actually prayed to the Lord of the hosts that produced Samuel, the prophet. And so, um, so our understanding of who the, he is and the banner that we're coming under, the Lord of hosts, is that he is a warrior, he's warrior king, but his war is different from anything that on earth. His war is on righteousness, on justice, on truth, on salvation. And he wants to lead, lead the people who are willing to contend in love, in humility, in prayer and fasting for the breaking of the demonic strongholds. So um, many scriptures, uh, Haggai, most of Haggai is uh, uh, on, on the Lord of hosts, Zechariah 4, 6, Zechariah 8, and Psalm 24, my favorite Psalm of all times, who is the King of glory? The Lord Almighty, who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. So we want to kind of pray from that kind of stream. <laughs> that's all i want to say i just want to pray okay together we lift up the banner of the name of god can you say it just lift up the banner for us i say it yeah 
or we say it together. Together, we just lift up the banner, the banner of the Amen. roller post, and we yes. come under the banner. We come yes. under, the, and yes. actually, Dean Drake said that when you come under a banner, you're coming under the DNA. Yes. We are coming under That's the good. DNA of the Lord of hosts, the Lord of hosts, that strain of the DNA right now for this time. <clears throat> you just come under that banner. Amen. Amen. Jesus Amen. Name. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> Mike's going to launch us um, just by reading Psalm 46, and then please feel free to pray as the Lord leads. I'm going to stop us at um, 8.55. Is that enough time, Kathy? Okay. And then Kathy's going to close us off in a song called, what is it called? Lord of Hosts. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Mike. Okay. <clears throat> okay, Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way, the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake after their surging, there is a river whose stream made glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in an uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spears. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. Amen. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Hallelujah. Amen. Please pray as the Lord leads. Molly, would you be able to uh, start us off here? Thank you. I recognize you from, from many calls. Thank you. Very kind of you. Very honored. And Lord, we just humble ourselves and come before the throne of mercy. We thank you for your corrections, your admonitions, and your encouragements, Lord, because you're a God of mercy and love and also righteous judgments. Lord, we come only by the blood of the Lamb of God, who is our righteousness, having put on the full armor of God. Father, we come and we now stand as your ecclesia. And Father, as we have received your word from your servant, we first look at our own selves and our own hearts and ask you, Lord, as you decree in Psalm 24, who may ascend into the hill of our God, he who has clean hands and a pure heart. And so, Father, we thank you that even though man looks on the outside, you look at the heart. And we humble ourselves and, Father, ask you to search by your spirit. For the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord and you search us from within. If there's any wicked way in us, Father, any unforgiveness towards anybody, in person, within our families, within our churches, the cultures and groups that we represent, the nations that we come before you, Father. Father, we ask, like Moses, may we find grace and favor in your sight. And we thank you for the power of the blood of the Lamb of God that has redeemed us from every curse and, Lord, given us life from the law of sin and death to life in Christ Jesus. We thank you that this is holy ground as we stand before the throne of grace with the heavenly host seated in heavenly places, Father, with the 24 elders casting our crowns before you. Lord, we are mindful 
of the gatherings of the firstborns and the gatherings of the just men made perfect. Lord, of the cloud of witnesses that are with us in this hour, encouraging us, God, as you look over the earth to do your will and for bringing down your kingdom upon the earth as it is in heaven. And Lord, that you have created us, Father, for such a time as this, to seek your face, to know your ways. O oh, ancient of days, as you open the books of the nations, we humble ourselves and seek and ask your ways be established, God. Once again, Father, bring us into that alignment and a posture and an alignment of our hearts before you and seek, Father, the good and the perfect ways of the Lord. We ask for your holiness. Lord, be restored to your church. The fear of the Lord be restored to your ecclesia, that your protocols and your ways may be made known. And we are grateful today to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And so, Lord, Help us to lift holy hands before you as we gather and pray, as we humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God and worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, we thank you that your plans for your church are good, for your people are good, for a hope and a future. And as you showed this morning, Father, it is not to harm. And Father, we thank you for that assurance. And as our sister has rightly lifted up that banner of Jehovah Shabur, the Lord of the hosts of the armies of heaven is with us. And if God is for us, who can be against us? So we thank you, Father, even in this turmoil, you are our refuge and our fortress, and we trust in you. And we thank you, Father, that you're bringing us to your table to partake of your body and your blood, because in that communion, we have life and life more abundantly. You are the bread that came from heaven. And Lord, as you were declaring this morning, even on the Temple Mount, Jesus was filled with the spirit and sent. And the enemy saw that and he knew this is the son of God. And yet you said to him, Lord, and the enemy asked Jesus, are you, if you are the son of God? And the son of God only said one thing, it is written. It is written. It is written that man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So Father, we receive your word. We receive your holy word with life and your broken body and blood that brings us and makes us one around your table. Father, we are your children. You are a father who pities the children and has mercy new mercies every day. So Father, we say a blessing over Canada in this mm. hour. Thank you for that, for that leaf. Mm. Lord, the tree of life that has leaves for healing of the nations. And in this hour, let that healing flow from, from your mountain, from your nation to the nations. Father, we thank you that today there's a turnaround on the Temple Mount. Is a turnaround for your people. There is your peace, the shalom of God for each and every one of us. We thank you for this, Father, in Yeshua's name. Amen. Wow. We agree with your prayer, Molly. We receive your blessing on behalf of Canada. We, Abba, we thank you for this blessed time that you have called, that you have called each one to share in this time for your pleasure, for your purpose and the 
purposes and that which you are building. And we continue to, to stand side by side in position, preferring one another, lifting one another up. And we will continue to, to, to press forward in your name, in your timing, in your will. And our prayer will continue in the release of the Lord of hosts. Kathy, take us to battle. Come behold the works of God, the nations at his feet. He breaks the bow and bends the spear and tells the wars to cease. O mighty one of Israel, you are on our side. We walk by faith in God who burns the chariots with fire. Lord of hosts, you're with us, with us in the fire, with us as a shelter, with us in the storm. You will lead us through the fiercest battle, oh, else would we go, but with the Lord of hosts. O oh God of Jacob, fierce and great, you lift your voice to speak. The earth that bows and all the mountains move into the sea. O oh Lord, you know the hearts of men and still you let them live. O oh God, who makes the mountains melt, come wrestle us and win. God who makes the mountains melt come wrestle us and win Lord of hosts you're with us with us in the fire with us as a shelter with us in the storm you will lead us through the fiercest battle oh would we go but with the Lord of hosts mm -hmm. the oceans roar you are the Lord of all the one who calms the wind and waves and makes my heart be still though the earth gives way the mountains move into the sea the nations rage i know my god is in control the oceans roar you are the lord of hosts the one who calms the wind and waves and makes my heart be still though the earth gives way the mountains move into the sea the nascent rage i know my god is in control lord of force you're with us with us in the fire with us as a shelter with us in the storm, you will lead us through the fiercest battle. Where else would we go but with the Lord of hosts? You will lead us through the fiercest battle. Sabayoth, we make way 
Lord Sabaoth, we make way for you. Lord Sabaoth, King of glory, King of glory, we make way for the King of glory. For Jehovah Sabaoth, we make way. For the King of glory, we make way. Jehovah Sabaoth. We do. We love this time that you gave us because you are, you have been in us, and with us, and amidst us, and we felt, felt your presence. And we make way. The ecclesia of the nations, brothers and sisters, one to another, we make way for the Lord. Sabaoth. The King of Kings, the King of Glory, we make way. And we make way for the next, the next team leading, next hour within the 50 hours of worship, we make way for you. We welcome you into this place of his presence. 